Hello everyone, um, I'm pretty sure you all know me, but my name is Diane. I'm the collections manager here at the Auburn Cord Duesenberg Automobile Museum. And today we're going to be discussing book and photography preservation. And before we get too far into things, I do want to take a minute to discuss what we mean by the word preservation. When you hear that word, what do you think of? This is the participatory part. <laughs> to keep, that's good. What else? <laughs> Thank you, Sam. <laughs> to keep in good shape, right. So the definition I really like comes from the Preservation Management Handbook, which is a really great resource I recommend to everyone. And in it, this is how they define preservation. The series of actions and interventions required to ensure continued and reliable access to objects for as long as they are deemed to be of value. So preservation is an action. It's something that you do. It's not something passive. And in this presentation, we're going to be going over some general preservation principles and guidelines that you can apply to almost any collection that you have. So we'll be discussing things like agents of deterioration, proper storage and handling techniques, and some of the materials that you would need to preserve your own collection. And uh, something I do want to mention here is everything we discuss in this presentation refers to the best practices. And this can be really hard to achieve, even for museums. So with your own personal collection, just remember you're always trying to get as close to these guidelines as possible, but oftentimes it's a really challenging thing to do. So to begin, let's talk about, if this will work, all right, well, agents of deterioration. There are 10 agents of deterioration. These are things that are gonna cause your collection to decay, deteriorate over time. The first is pests. So when you hear a pest, what do you think? What might be a pest to your photography or to your book collection? <laughs> well, we have our little friend up in the corner. That's called a silverfish. They love to eat paper. You'll actually see them make burrowed holes in books or archival material. Um, cockroaches, mice, rats, all kinds of things. And the best way to mitigate this is to keep the environment that you have your collection in really not inhabitable for pests. So preventing food, drink, um, checking for moisture, checking for any infestations over time is a, a good way to just make sure you don't have any pests affecting your collection. Second is light. What kind of problems might be caused by light with books and photography? Fading, that's the number one problem. It's gonna fade over time. And every type of material has a different light level that's best for it, and we're gonna be discussing that a little bit later on in the presentation. Pollutants, these are things like dirt, debris, bug sprays, even perfumes, aerosols, cleaning products, all that contain chemicals that can irritate and deteriorate paper or photography. Water, uh, probably one of the most common agents of deterioration. It can get into your collection in a number of different ways, whether it's a leaky roof, a burst pipe, um, you know, all kinds of different ways. And that, of course, is going to cause potentially mold to grow, which is a big problem. Then we have fire, probably the most destructive of the agents of deterioration. Uh, you know, if something burns in a fire, it simply doesn't exist anymore. If it gets water damaged, you can salvage it. But even if something isn't completely destroyed in a fire, you're still left with things like smoke damage and soot that you have to mitigate. Temperature and humidity. This is something we talk a lot about in the preservation field. Every type of material has a particular range of temperatures and humidity levels that really help sustain it the best. Too high, you can get mold growth. Too low with things like paper, it can become brittle and break over time. Next, we have what I call the human agents of deterioration, theft and vandalism. Here, you wanna make sure you know who has access to your collection uh, and who might wanna take it from you, I suppose. Uh, forced and improper handling. So this is something like if you're moving an object and you drop it and it breaks, or let's say with a book, you have some pages stuck together and you're trying to separate them and one of the pages rips, things like that. Neglect. This is where you just sort of leave something to rot, right? Uh, but there is a concept in the preservation world called benign neglect. That's when you have something that's in really good condition. It's really solid, you know, um, you don't have any real concerns about it. Where often the best course of action is to just kind of set it on a shelf, 
and leave it alone. Monitor it, make sure there's no pest activity, no water getting in, things like that. Now, out of all of these, which would you guess is the number one cause of concern, the greatest risk to your personal collection? Fire, all right, any other guesses? Temperature and humidity? Uh, it is actually uh, improper handling. The number one way an artifact gets damaged is through improper handling. So one of the concepts we're gonna be going over a little bit later and something I'm probably gonna sound like a broken record on as we go through this is handle your material as little as possible. That's gonna be the number one way that it's gonna get damaged. So, and I mentioned this next thing a couple of times in this slide, mold. Mold is a big problem for collections. And so I wanted to take just a minute to discuss it really briefly. If you find mold in your collection, often the best course of action is to freeze the material to deactivate it. And then you can go in either with a soft brush and wipe away the mold, or you can use a HEPA vacuum. HEPA is referred to a type of filter that traps very small particles that in conventional vacuums would simply be released back into the air. So this is a really good thing to have on hand. The Northeast Document Conservation Center recommends these six steps for mitigating mold. Um, and I've really condensed them here. So I really recommend going onto their websites and reading everything they have to say. So the first thing you wanna do if you find mold growth, isolate the object because you don't want that mold moving on to something else in your collection. Isolate it. Determine the cause of the mold. Is moisture getting in somewhere? Do you have improper humidity? You then wanna modify the environment to correct whatever is happening there. Implement safety procedures and precautions. The number one priority is always human safety. You don't wanna be breathing in mold spores, so you know, make sure you're protecting yourself when you're working with this. Deactivate the mold growth. Again, freezing is a really good way to do this. And then clean the affected items. So do we have any questions about mold or the 10 agents of deterioration? Yes, Sam? Is it a serious question? <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> that was a fun day. Yeah, so uh, several months ago, I got, I was sitting at my desk, got a text from Sam, said, come, in, come to archives immediately, which is never a good text for you to get. And I go in there and we have a leaking pipe right on top of one of our cabinets that's holding some archival material. So we immediately start pulling things out, getting them wrapped in bags, um, you know, finding spaces to dry them out. And then uh, Sam had to figure out where that leak was coming from. We had to get buckets out, we had to get fans out. It's a really long process when you have water get in. And luckily I don't think we got any mold growth from that. We didn't find any because we caught it quickly enough. But uh, yeah. Oh. <laughs> oh, was it? Okay, I, see, I don't even remember that happening. So yes, we did find mold growth. Yes, Walter. Good question. Uh, so you have a freezer at home. What you do, you wrap your book, let's say it's a book, in an archivally safe plastic. You stick it in the freezer. You wait till it's frozen. <laughs> it, it's a surprisingly straightforward process. Um, now, of course, you do want to be careful, again, with the moisture. Uh, you will then, as you're dethawing it, there's processes for that, where again, you want it out on an absorbent material. You want fans blowing not directly on it, but around it to keep the air circulating so that it can dry at an appropriate level. Yeah, good question. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, I wasn't able to find a really good picture of it happening with a book, but here you see a HEPA vacuum being used on a textile and you actually see they have a screen on top of it. That way the bristles don't come into direct contact with the objects. So this is all you're thinking about. Okay, how is this gonna damage my object and how can I prevent that? Okay. Right, any other questions? I did not expect mold to uh, generate so many questions. <laughs> all right. So another thing I wanna to touch on real briefly is the use of gloves. 
You'll often see in TVs and movies, people who work in museums wearing white cotton gloves. We talk about the white cotton glove treatments. In actuality, the most common type of glove used by museum professionals and preservationists are blue nitrile gloves, which I actually have an example of here if anyone wants to see them. Um, in fact, white gloves have a little bit of a reputation in the preservation field. The cotton menace. So a woman who works as a reference librarian for the Smithsonian wrote an article titled No Love for White Gloves or the Cotton Menace. And in it, she says this. It would make sense that these historical objects should be handled with white gloves to keep them clean, right? Wrong. Well, mostly. That's a line to keep in mind. Wrong. Well, mostly. That's the answer to most, almost anything in the preservation field. That's true, mostly. There's always going to be exceptions and things you have to consider. So with uh, paper objects like books, you're going to want to handle your collection with clean, dry hands. Can anyone guess why you wouldn't wear gloves when handling a book? No? Have you ever tried to pick up a piece of paper when you're wearing like winter gloves? It's pretty hard, right? Anytime you're wearing a glove that reduces your dexterity, increasing the chance that the paper is going to rip when you handle it. Now with photography, you're going to want to wear those nitrile gloves to prevent fingerprints and things like that. Make sense? Yeah, so for every object, it's a, sometimes you wear gloves, sometimes you don't. Just depends on what you're working with. So just a couple more points about proper artifact handling. Again, handle as little as possible. That's the number one way your collection is gonna be damaged. Where are the weak points? So let's say you have a book and the spine is broken. You're gonna to wanna to consider that and how you handle it. If you have a photograph that's torn on a corner, you're obviously not gonna to wanna to pick it up by that corner. So always look at the object to see where the weak points are and always provide the needed support. If you have something that's very fragile, you can get an archivally safe piece of board, slip it under it so you can pick it up and move it safely. Any questions on artifact handling? All right. So another really important part of preservation is considering your storage layers. Every object has multiple storage layers around it. Um, and each of them, you're going to want to consider different questions to make sure that your object is as protected as possible. So what would you guess is the very first, the widest storage layer for an object? Any guess? The building that it's in. So for us, it's this museum. So what kind of things do you want to consider with the building to make sure your object is protected? Leaky roof, our favorite, yeah. <laughs> All right, what else? Temperature. The temperature, good. Humidity, Humidity yeah. Uh, huh? Light level. Light level. How about security? Yeah, you know, do we lock our doors at night? Do we have an alarm system? All things to consider. All right, so what's the second layer? The room, the room. yep. And you're gonna have a lot of those same questions that you had with the building, with the room. Is it temperature controlled? Is it humidity controlled? Do we have any issues with the electrical system or the plumbing? Um, if it's in an attic, is anything leaking? Um, you know, is there any pest activity? All things to consider. All right. What, what's the next layer? Sam, you know all these answers. You're not allowed to answer. You're the curator. <laughs> Generally speaking, yeah. Um, there are different, again, it depends on your particular situation. For museums, the ideal is to have the storage area be in a place with limited access. So like here, our small artifacts and our archive are accessible only by a small number of staff to keep everything very secure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, in your own home, that's going to be a little more tricky, right? <laughs> so, same already answered for you, the cabinet or the shelving unit. Here you want to consider, is the shelving unit archivally safe? Is it made from an archivally safe material? Um, you know, metal shel shelving is often preferred uh, because wood shelves, you have a couple of different problems, not least of which is if a fire occurs, going to be a lot harder for that metal to spread the fire than for the wood. All right, then what do we have after the cabinet? 
you're not allowed to answer. <laughs> so your container, right? Um, so if you have a scrapbook or a photo album, or if your books are kept in boxes, and actually I should point out here that not all objects are gonna have all of these storage layers, right? If you have a series of books, they're probably just gonna be on that shelving unit, not in boxes. They could be, but not necessarily. So again, you wanna make sure that you have archivally safe boxes. I have a couple of examples here. These we call blue boxes. They come in a variety of different sizes. Um, they are pH neutral, acid free, and we're gonna be talking about why that's important in a little bit. All right, and after the container, what do you think we have? Well, close, yeah. <laughs> Wrapping. So let's say you have, again, a book that maybe has some of the cover coming off of it, peeling off. You can wrap that in an archivally safe plastic, place it in a box, on a shelf, in a secure room, in a building that has absolutely proper light, humidity, and temperature levels. This is the ideal. And under all this, we finally have the object that you're trying to protect. So, uh, any questions about storage layers? No? Easy, right? Pretty straightforward. All right. So I've used this phrase now a couple of times, archivally safe. What does that mean? Right? You'll, you'll hear it a lot. So let's define it. Really all it means is that the material is physically durable and chemically stable. So you want to watch for what's called off-gassing. Off-gassing is the release of airborne particulates and gases that come from a variety of materials. Archivally safe material does not off-gas. So a couple of words to look for when you're trying to decide what to use with your collection. Polyethylene, also called ethafoam, which comes in a variety of different shapes and sizes that can be used for different things. Polypropylene, another type of archivally safe plastic. We use different sheeting for our photographs to organize them, again, archivally safe. And again, yeah, you know, we have for smaller photographs, and then if you have like an eight by 10, you can get it in a larger size. Yeah, they are... Mm -hmm. No. Uh, there are certain companies that I would recommend buying from. Um, for example, these boxes and a lot of our material we get through a company called Gaylord Archival. Uh, it's where a lot of museums get their material from. But these are the words that you want to look for. Um, there's no particular like subset that's better than another. As long as you see these, you're generally okay. That's a good point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> we got our million dollar idea, Sam. <laughs> uh, just a few other ones. Uh, mylar, often acrylic, can be a good choice. Um, again, looking for things that are acid free or pH neutral. Um, unbleached cotton can be used for a few different things. Absorbrin, I always pronounce that wrong, uh, which you see here is kind of this pink putty like material that can be used to gently clean the covers of books which again, without harming it, which is our number one priority. Uh, metal, again, we talked about metal shelving being a good choice. What you want to avoid are things like cardboard, wood, a lot of adhesives, rubber, and PVC. These things are gonna off-gas or deteriorate and harm your collection over time. Any questions about archivally safe material? Another thing I want to touch on briefly is the concept of inherent vice. Has anyone heard of this before? Not you. <laughs> so inherent vice is the characteristic of an object that leads to its own decay or destruction. So to give a really clear example of this, has anyone seen this piece of art before? It was in the news a lot a couple of years ago. This is a piece called Love is in the Bin by an artist named Banksy. It was originally called Girl with Balloon. It was a self-destructing piece of art. So here you see it after it's self-destructed. This is a really clear example of inherent vice. The piece literally destroyed itself, right? But if you're working with more conventional material, say paper, um, that can contain a substance called lignin, 
which makes paper deteriorate quickly over time. Now, some paper goes through a chemical process as it's being produced to remove that substance, but things like newsprint is full of it. So that'll deteriorate more quickly over time. And you always wanna understand with your collection, what are the inherent vices and how can I mitigate them? So, any questions? Oh, all right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's gonna depend on the type of photograph that you're working with. There are certain types of film, for example, that can, uh, as it gets older, become more flammable and more unstable. So it just depends on the particular type of photography that you're working with. Each is gonna have slightly different inherent vice. But we also have to remember everything is always decaying, right? Everything is deteriorating. And we're just trying to get ahead of that process. All right, repairs and restoration. Wanted to mention this again really quickly before we get into more specifics of book and photography preservation. Um, when you're considering if you should repair or restore your book, your photography, any kind of artifact, you always want to consult a professional conservator. Anyone here watch antique road shows? I'm a terrible person because my favorite moment is when someone comes in and says, well, I cleaned this or I restored it. And what do they always tell them? <laughs> yeah, yeah. There was, yeah, there was actually one case where a woman, it was a Tiffany's lamp. She cleaned the base of it. And what they told her was basically, well, if you hadn't cleaned it, it would have been worth fifty to $60,000. Now it's worth 10000 But aside from monetary value, why might you not want to restore an object? True, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep, so that can affect it. There's another big reason though. You can actually rob that object of some of its historic value. Think of like the nose on the Sphinx, right? It's broken, but should it be restored? That's part of its history. If I have a well-loved book from my childhood, is the underlining and highlighting and dog ears part of its history that I wanna keep? So again, there's no real clear answers here. It's all these different things you have to consider, which can make preservation a little bit frustrating. <laughs> Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh no, <laughs> that's a perfect example, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, see, this, now, now you know, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah, I'll, I always consult a professional conservator before you go to repair or restore anything that you have. So on that note, we're gonna move over to talking more specifically about books. So first question, what are books made out of? Yes. Paper, Paper yeah. What else? Hmm. We can have wood, we can have ink, leather. Some books have leather covers, metals, wood. And to just kind of show you here, we have kind of a more modern book made primarily of paper. And then here we have a much older book where you can see metal elements, leather elements, paper elements. Mm -hmm. Yep, yeah, some they did use thread, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, animal skins. Um, so when you're working with books, you can't just say, well, it's just made of paper. You have to really look and see, okay, what is this material? Because every single one of these elements is going to have a different preservation need. And in fact, even a different preservation environment. What's best for metal is not always best for leather, which is not always best for paper. So it gets a little bit complicated. Which of these pieces are you gonna focus on preserving, right? So when storing books, number one, you want to avoid basement, garages, attics, and windows. And I'm, can anyone tell me why after all we've talked about? Our favorite, our favorite words? <laughs> Moisture, right? Yeah. Um, leaky roof, water getting in windows, you're going to have light coming in. You, now you can obviously put up curtains or something to help mitigate that. But again, for most people, if you don't want to make that kind of investment, better to just avoid it, right? Uh, keep away from heat and water sources. It's going to cause warping to a lot of different elements. You might get moisture again. Uh, metal shelving, or let's say you can't get metal shelving, you just have a wood shelf, you don't want to go out and spend all this money on a metal shelf. Get a piece of epiphone. Cut it to size, lay it on the shelf, and now you have a barrier between your book collection 
and the wood. Uh, shelving, generally you want it, it's recommended six inches from the floor, often that's not really that possible, and that's in case there's flooding. That way, you know, anything that's sitting on the ground is obviously going to be very affected by a flood. If you give yourself a few inches, you have a little bit of safety there. Um, very large volumes can be stored flat, but you also want to keep books of the same size together because then they'll actually support each other. If you imagine like a really small book between two large books, they'll, they'll start to bend in towards each other. Um, and again, archivally safe boxes and wrapping as needed. Any questions on any of this? Yes, Sam. I don't know, I've never been in the archive. <laughs> uh, we, uh, we have metal shelving here and actually our, fire, our uh, filing cabinets are fireproof. To add another layer of protection. Yeah. Or are you getting at something else? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a good point, yeah. You want to watch for all of that, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Sam, what kind do we use here? Thing, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We also have a level of the F foam on top of all That's, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, as you can see, there's a lot of different. Uh, kind of almost tiny details that you're thinking of. And remember how I said at the beginning of this presentation, it's almost impossible to meet every single one of these best practices. Kind of makes a little bit of sense now, right? <laughs> and especially again, in your own home for your personal collection, the attic, the basement, an area with a large win window might be the only place you do have to store something. So you just wanna monitor that area and make sure that again, no moisture's getting in, there's no pest activity, things like that. Um, you can get uh, meters for the humidity and even the light levels. Uh, here, for example, um, our archival area, when we go in to grab something, as soon as we leave, the light gets turned off. So even though everything's already in boxes and protected that way, the light is not left on unless somebody is actually in the room. Mm -hmm. Very good, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So, uh, oh, absolutely. And actually, it's a, a funny point. I don't wear any perfume because of that very reason. Because if something is rotting, I need to be able to smell that and be like, okay, something's funky in here. Something's gone wrong. I need to find it, you know? Uh, so a lot of my decisions about what I wear to work are determined by making sure the preservation environment is protected. I don't wear jewelry because again, when you're handling things, that jewelry could scratch or hit different things. Don't wear perfume. I usually keep my hair pulled back in a ponytail so my hair doesn't get everywhere. Um, yeah, a lot of different steps taken. So. Don't use a lot of lotions, yep. Mm -hmm. And you know, washing hands really thoroughly, which now is on everybody's radar a lot more and then drying very thoroughly. Mm -hmm. yep. Sam, you look like you had a, a statement. No? All right. All right. Uh, temperature, humidity, and light levels. For books, generally speaking, a max level of 50 lux. And just to kind of give you an idea of what that means, I found this nice chart. Um, now, if you're gonna put something on display, this might not be possible. But yeah, we're talking about best practices. If in the ideal environments, 50 lux max. Uh, your temperature in the mid to low 60s, uh, generally best, with a humidity in the 40 to 55% range. And what's really important is to keep all these levels stable. If you get levels going up and down a lot, that can cause more damage than if you're actually keeping them steady at a not ideal level. Any questions? Yes, Sam. That's a good point, yeah. Mm -hmm.
Mm -hmm. Yeah. And just as another point, we have monitors throughout the museum to monitor the temperature and the humidity. Um, and we take readings from those, what is it, uh, once a month now. Um, data loggers, thank you, I couldn't remember what they were called, <laughs> yeah. Um, and I, I've gotten to the point now where I feel like when I walk into the archive, I can tell if it's even two degrees off. I'm like walking, I'm like, Sam, it's warm in here. We gotta, what's going on? <laughs> oh. Um, but you also want to consider your own human comfort, right? Because sometimes these will not be the most comfortable for a human to live in, even if it's the best for the object that you're working with. So again, this weird balancing act that you're trying to do. A um, Couple of other points, cool temperatures extend the life of an object, but again, if you have very low temperature RH levels with materials like leather and paper, that can cause it to become brittle. So colder is not always better, but cool is usually the sweet spot where you want it. Um, too high of temperatures, again, can promote mold growth. Uh, light exposure, we've talked about, can cause discoloration and fading. Stability of these levels is the most essential. All right, handling. With books, you always want to use two hands. Generally, for almost any object, you're going to want to use at least two hands. For anything very large, get a friend, get a buddy to come and help you move it. Again, you're moving, again, the most dangerous point for your objects. Um, when you're moving from a shelf, grip it by the sides, not from the top or bottom. Those are gonna be some of the weak points that can easily dislodge. Um, lay flat, or you can use a book cradle, which I show a couple of examples of here. The one on top is an acrylic one, and the one on the bottom is actually an adjustable level ethafoam book cradle with these two very light weights to help keep the book open very gently. Um, we also have, this goes by a couple of different names, a delaminating tool also called a bone folder. Anyone guess what this is used for? No, Sam, you're not allowed to answer. You can use it to turn the page, yep, and then it has another really great function if you again have two pages stuck together. This has a rounded edge so you can very gently move the two pages apart. So really useful tool. All right, let's talk a little bit about photography. Here I've listed out some of the different types of photography that exist. Anyone ever realize this is how many different types of photography exist in the world? Yeah. Uh, the, uh, and I always pronounce this uh, one wrong, de Guillermo type. Uh, was the first type of photography. Uh, it was developed in the 1830s. That's how far back it goes. Every single one of these is gonna have its own preservation needs. And as you can see from this list, we're not gonna have enough time to go over every single one of them, but I do again wanna give you some general guidelines on the best way to preserve your photography collection. Uh, so let's get into storage, our favorite topic. Just like with books, you want to avoid basement garages, attics, and windows. You want to keep away from heat and water sources, metal shelvings or cabinets. Uh, here I took a photograph of our fireproof filing cabinets where we store our photographs. And again, keep them several inches from the floor in case of flooding, archival boxes, archival sleeving. Um, and what we use is called hanging storage, which again you see here. So every single photograph is hung. Now, why might that be a good option for photography? We're not gonna have to touch the photograph directly. We can just lift that right on out, take a look at it and put it back as needed. Um, I generally don't recommend things like scrapbooks because those can often include other elements, adhesives, cardboards, that can affect your collection. But you can also get a nice archivally safe box with a three ring binder in it. Get some of these nice, I mean, polyethylene, polypropylene sleevings to store everything, make it a little bit more compact and a little bit easier for you. Yeah. Uh, you know, I honestly don't know. <laughs> Sam, <laughs> that's a good question. <laughs> It's 
And uh, just an, another note, um, some of these systems to protect your collection can be quite expensive. Uh, so for example, the box that you see here uh, on the bottom, one box runs between $15 to $20. So not always feasible for a lot of people, um, but again, if you keep these principles in mind and get as close to them as possible, right? Like we keep talking about. All right. Any questions on this slide? Well. Now for photography, again, much like with books, your max lux level, you want it at 50. Um, temperature between 40 and 55 degrees, a little bit cooler than with books, and a little bit lower with the humidity as well, between 30 and 50%. Um, yes, Walter? That's good. Uh, so I actually wrote down the definition. Let me find it here. Oh, I, don't, I didn't put it on this slide. Uh, so it is, if I'm remembering correctly, the amount of light that falls on one square meter from a light source, okay? Um, and again, you can get data loggers or meters to measure that within your own space. Um, but this chart gives you a, a pretty good idea just so you can eyeball it, because that's, again, not gonna be possible for a lot of people to go out and buy all this specialized equipment, right? <laughs> and again, I do wanna, you know, acknowledge that when you're displaying something, these levels are not gonna be possible. Can you imagine walking into a museum and it's 40 degrees with 30% humidity, you know? <laughs> or being in your own home and having it at these levels? Yeah. <laughs> I'm cold all the time, so that would not be a good experience for me, right? Uh, so with handling, these are all a lot of things that we've already gone over. You want to wear nitrile gloves to prevent fingerprints. But again, let's say you have a really deteriorated photograph that's very fragile. The best option might be to not wear gloves because, again, you don't want to cause any additional ripping or anything, you know, chipping off anymore. Uh, making sure you have a clean workstation when you are handling it. Um, please do not use paper clips. They are the bane of my existence. <laughs> <laughs> they will leave a rust mark over time. That's why I say that. Uh, you know, avoid things like rubber bands, adhesives. Uh, when turning over, you can use a tool, again, something like this, or a miniature spatula. Just always be careful when handling, and do not overhandle. You look like you have a question. Hmm. Nope. Hmm. All right. So, obviously, if you have a book or a photography collection, you want to enjoy it. You want to be able to look at these memories and things, right? But I keep harping on, don't handle it, don't handle it, don't handle it. So what can you do? High quality scans are often a really good option for this, but it's not foolproof. Technology is constantly evolving and constantly becoming obsolete. Anyone remember these? <laughs> the good old floppy disk. Right? <laughs> so museums may have stored information about different collections on a floppy disk. Can they be read anymore? You're going to have to find specialized equipment for it. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, for a while, particularly in the 90s, gold CDs were really big. Uh, they were allegedly supposed to last like 300 years or something like that. Uh, but again, all this technology is starting to evolve again and change. So even if you make really good, high quality scans of something, you store everything digitally, always be aware of what's happening with technology and moving it to a different format as needed to make sure that it, this information is preserved for as long as possible. Any questions? Yes. Mm-hmm. 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 
that's a great question that I honestly can't answer because I've not had the opportunity to work with them. Um, I would recommend reaching out again to an organization that has those materials that really knows how to work with them. Or there are uh, organizations like the Northeast uh, Document Conservation Center that could be really helpful with questions like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's actually a good point that I didn't talk about in the photography slide. Um, certain types of photography actually don't do well in polypropylene or polyethylene. Um, they actually do better in acid-free paper sleeves. That's a good point, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, you know, each of these, again, slightly different preservation needs. And you really want to know what you have and what those needs are. Yeah, yeah that's... Good question. Um, another uh, point I want to make is, again, when you make scans or save information, keep it in multiple locations. Redundancy is important. You know, here we have our paper files, we have our database, we back up that database, you know, you're adding layers of protection, so hopefully nothing is lost over time. So record keeping is vital. This was my favorite slide to make because this is the most important piece of information you're going to need to know. Keep good records, keep good records, keep good records, keep good records. Um, a lot of information is lost over time. I was going through some photo albums at my dad's house a few months ago. There was one of a vacation we took when I was like 12 and I was flipping through it and said, oh, I remember doing that. I don't remember doing that. Who was that person? I don't remember them being there. <laughs> so you wanna save as much information as possible. And to demonstrate this, we're gonna look at two photographs and you're gonna tell me if they're worth saving or not. So here is our first photograph. What is it? It's an iceberg, good. And I will tell you, this photo was taken from a German ship in 1912. Should we keep it? Yeah? Is it related to anything important? We don't know, yeah, but the reason that this sailor on a German ship took this photograph was because he noticed black and red paint smeared on the side of the iceberg. It's believed this is the iceberg that sunk the Titanic. Now, if that information wasn't saved and you just found this in your photo collection, like, okay, cool, an iceberg, right? Mm hmm How about this one? What's going on here? Oh. So do you notice anything odd in the background? What's that back there, right? A tank, yeah. So, and then I don't know if you guys notice this figure over here. Does he look familiar? This is a different angle of this photograph, which almost all of us have seen. This is the Tiananmen Square. Uh, tank man who became very famous. So you have it here, so probably a few moments, maybe a minute before this famous photograph was taken. Yeah. <laughs> well, no one really knows what happened to him, is the thing. <laughs> no. oh, mm -hmm. So I just wanted to again use these two photographs to show you why it's so important to keep really good records. You know, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and actually, if we, if we go back to this one, just being able to describe what's happening in a photograph, you know, really seeing that there is a tank in the background, that there's this figure standing, you know, holding some bags. Um, it's really kind of amazing how often we look at things, but we don't actually see them. I'm a little bit embarrassed to say how long it took me to realize here how few of the cars have rear view mirrors or side mirrors, you know, because um, our brain kind of fills things in, right? So really looking at an object and seeing what's there. Stop shaking your head, Sam. <laughs> All right, uh, so in discussing uh, record keeping, I wanna show you an example of how we keep records here. This is an example from a program our museum uses. It's the most common type of uh, software for collections management in the museum field called PassPerfect. 
here we have a photograph and we have a description of it. We have a title. If we knew the photographer's name, that would be saved. Provenance, who owned it before us, all kinds of information. Now, a system like this is gonna be, you know, not practical for most people, so what could you do at home? Keeping a written log. You know, an Excel document is always a great thing to save information. And again, keeping that information in multiple locations. So. Any questions, comments, concerns? Uh, so everything, all of that is kept within our database, right? Um, and we also, again, keep paper records. So if you were to donate something to us, we would fill out what's called a deed of gift with a description of what you're donating. And then that would get put into a file, usually with a photograph of what it is that you've donated. Um, so should anything happen to our digital database, we have that as a backup. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Exactly, yeah. So yeah, mm -hmm. yep, the object itself is the ultimate backup, right? And uh, just as a, another aside here, if nothing else, if you can't get any other information saved about what you have in your collection, location, location, location. Because as long as you can find it, most of this information can be filled in later, hopefully. But being able to find it is the first step. So what do you do when a disaster happens? When a fire, a flood, something like that happens? There are two main kinds of disasters. There's natural and there's man-made. So your natural disasters would be what? Flooding, yep. Lightning, hail, a tornado, all that stuff. Man-made, you have that theft, that vandalism, things like that. So what's the number one rule in any disaster? Human safety. <laughs> you know, Please don't run into a burning building to save your photo collection. <laughs> Ho hopefully you have it in fireproof filing cabinets, everything will be fine. Um, but yeah, human safety always number one. And then you want to determine and mitigate whatever disaster is happening. Again, you have a burst pipe, you find leaking, you know, take care of it and then look at your collection and what needs to happen. Um, remove the items from the affected area and get them out of the way. So again, they're not retaining more moisture or something like that. And then you really want to clean and make sure that that area gets up to snuff, right? You know, you fix the pipe, you clean the soot from the fire, whatever it is. Um, remember with preservation, the best course of action is a good offense is a good defense. You want to prevent things from happening as opposed to trying to fix them after the fact. So. It is ongoing work. You are never done with this. You get something stored real nicely in a box, in a nice cabinet. Well, that box is gonna be need, need to be replaced at some point. You're gonna to need to check for pest activity. Um, you know, maybe your grandkid wants to come over and look at the old photos. So you pull them out and expose them to light. All these things happen. So you're never really done with preservation. It's an ongoing task. So just some takeaways. Determine what you have, that's step one. What do I have? What is it? What is it made out of? Assess the condition and again, see what do I need to do with that? Can I just, is it in really good condition and can I just let it sit basically? Or do I need to consult a conservator on something? Document it, again, that good record keeping. Uh, consider the best organization system. You know, here we have things organized in a certain way, but for a personal collection, a different system might work best for you. Uh, make redundancies. Uh, analyze your preservation environment. Do you have a smoke alarm? You know, are you able to get a humidity data log or things like that? And always work to make the most ideal preservation environment that's, you know, uh, accessible to you, that's possible for you. And reach out to an expert as you need it. Need it. I can all give you Sam's phone number if you need to <laughs> contact him. Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> Any questions? And I just want to end with a list of really great resources that you can uh, 
can buy or reach out to. One is the museum registration manual. It's a really good general reference guide. A lot of different information about organizing and preserving different types of material. When I already mentioned the preservation management handbook, another really good general reference guide. Um, a lot of websites you can go to, the Society of American Archivists is a great resource. I've mentioned this one a couple of times, the Northeast Document Conservation Center. And both the Library of Congress and the National Archives have a lot of information up on their websites. I reference those multiple times. They're a really great resource. Um, American Library Association, and then again, Gaylord Archival is a really good resource for the material you might need to acquire if you want to create these storage systems for your collection. Yeah. Um, it depends. So, uh, for example, it was last year now. Huh? Or, yeah, uh, the uh, American Alliance of Museums uh, was having their annual conference and uh, we were going to go, and then 2020 happens. So me, Sam, and Brandon created an online presentation on um, uh, automobile preservation. And my part of that was talking about how do we preserve the records of the automobiles. Sam talked a lot more about you know, the different pieces of the automobiles and how you handle those, clean those, preserve them. Um, so we do share with other institutions. Mm -hmm. Good question. Any other questions? All right, well, everyone come up here and get Sam's phone number for when you have a preservation question. <laughs> and join us next month for uh, it's uh, Preserving Family History. Mm -hmm.